Welcome to my program. I am so thrilled that you are here with me. Rabbi Saul Solomon of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am hosting this program to bring the world a taste of Judaica, a little hint of what it means to be a Jew. Be it a good Jew, like me, or like you. We had our very first episode of Shalom Dammit last week. So that makes this episode, you should pardon the expression, number two. Which brings me to the one thing that I am most worried about that gave me a sleepless night or two besides my prostate. It's the second time jinx, the sophomore slump, the shicey seconds. We all know what that is. You have this one amazing program that everybody loves. But then the second comes along and all the critics are Ay, and poo poo and bleh, too much like the first. He lost the inspiration. This is the leftovers that weren't good enough to get into the first show. You know, every singer who releases a record album, or as the kids are calling it these days, eight tracks, every singer dreads the follow up fall down. They want you to stay within the confines of a tight little space while constantly growing. Try that with a penis and see where that gets you. So, I'm a bit anxious about this episode, I admit. It would be most embarrassing if it sucked. Because not only do I have a congregation to impress, but like the Frankfurters, I have to answer to a higher authority. But here's the good news, goddammit. I think this is going to be as fine or better an episode than the first one. Okay, I'm bluffing. So without further ado, let us begin this probably disappointing episode. I hope you enjoy it anyway. Autumn is such an exciting time for the Jews because we have so many wonderful holidays. Rosh Hashanah, in which we welcome the Jewish New Year. Sukkot, the Harvest Festival, Simchas Torah, where we rejoice in receiving the five books of Moses, and Yom Kippur, where we starve and cry and smell each other's bad breath in the synagogue. But there's another Jewish holiday we may be forgetting, because no one's really sure if it is a Jewish holiday. I'm talking about Columbus Day, Christopher Columbus or as the Italians would say, Cristoforo Colombo, or as the Spanish would say, Cristobal Colon, which if I were him, I would sue. Christopher Columbus, or as the Jews might say, Carl Cohen. You see, Columbus Day just might qualify as a Jewish holiday. And not only because all the stores have 20% off. It's a proven theory that Christopher Columbus might have been a Jew. A secret Jew, perhaps, but a Jew. Because his parents may have been forced to convert. Remember, these were the years of the Spanish Inquisition, which nobody expected because their chief weapon was surprise and fear. Fear and surprise were their chief weapons. So outwardly, Columbus was of the Christian faith. But there is ample evidence to suggest that under different political circumstances, the Spanish explorer and Italian legend would have instead founded the first kibbutz. He would have founded it in Greenland, but that's another story. So forget the books and the textbooks you've read about Columbus. Forget the poem that goes in 1400 and blah de blue. I'm going to give you the real story the true Columbus epic via a little poem that I call 
good boy Columbus. And if you are still convinced after hearing it that Columbus was a Shagitz, well, you probably put mayonnaise on pastrami. Good boy Columbus. In 1491, Spain told the Jews, get ready to run. You're going to get killed. You're going to get hurt. If you want to stay here, you got to convert. The Inquisition was in full blossom, so hundreds of Hebrews were playing possum. With guns to their heads and knives to their chest, they crossed themselves and hoped for the best. While martyrs' mothers cried and grieved, they made believe that they believed, accepting Christ and the title converso. But underneath, Jews were Jews and vice versa. Because when you're at the mercy of a Torquemada, a life lived in secret is better than nada. And yet, the government still feared conspiracy. They sent out tribunals to flush out heresy. They tortured and burned every man, girl, and boy who once was a Jew, but then turned to Goy. The non-converted, though under suspicion, were not so affected by the Inquisition. That is, until the following year, when Spain's true colors were made quite clear by King Ferdinand, a miserable fella, and his bitch of a wife, Queen Isabella. In 1492-ish, Spain expelled everyone who was Jewish. 150,000 left Spain and never touched a flan again. By the middle of the summer, all the Jews had vanished. They turned Portuguese, where they once were Spanish. And yet, the day after the Hebrews were gone, who should show up but Chris Colon? That's a Jewish variation on his real name, Colombo. And the clues that he's Jewish are many in number. First of all, the dates he chose are all biblical references used by Jews. Second of all, the day he left was the ninth of Av, on which Jews are bereft. You want more proof? Well, here it gets better. At the top of his mail, he'd write two little letters, the Hebrew letters, Bet and Hey, with the help of God, is what they say. But some are not convinced by this. After all, how could a lanceman be named Chris? Perhaps his parents were converted Moranos, putting borscht and chopped liver in their mole poblanos. I realize that's Mexico and not Mallorca, but what do you expect from me, Lorca? Anywho, Columbus the convert didn't get frantic. He asked for three ships to cross the Atlantic. Said Queen Isabella from her place in the palace, go find the new world with Spain uber Alice. And so he embarked in a fine Spanish galleon, which makes you wonder why Columbus stays Italian. And what about all of Columbus's crew? Since they were expelled, they were likely Jews too. They sailed out of Lisbon singing Dayenu on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Moishe Rabbeinu. In October, they landed on a place cold and windy. Said wrong way Columbus, this must be the Indies. Naked savages came out to greet them. Columbus's crew thought the Indians would eat them. But Christopher said, see the riches they've got? We'll make them love Jesus, whether they like it or not. For the country of Spain, he claimed the new world. And the Indians cried, because they knew it'd be spurled. For they were now slaves with Columbus the master. He founded a colony, a total disaster. So, after a while, Chris gathered new ships, and over the years he made three more trips. He couldn't find India. He couldn't find China. He couldn't find hairs on a French girl's vagina. Nevertheless, Columbus made history by making the New World less of a mystery. In 1506, old Chris passed away. He was nearly forgotten, the history books say. But now we revere him for never quitting, despite omnipresent anti-Semitic. But he persevered through courage and prayer to discover America, which was already there. So, 
Go shop at light sales, watch the parade, or look at the mess of this country we've made. But kindly remember, be you left, right, or middle, that klutz with a compass was clearly a yiddle. Tired of kinderlach, my sweet children, gather round your television sets, put down your iPods, your Game Boys, your Tefillin, it's story time. I'm going to read and you're going to listen. And you might even enjoy, maybe. I really don't care. Today's wonderful story is The Little Mezuzah by Tova Feinberg. Copyright 1994, Menorah Flame Books. For my husband, my children, and the little mezuzah in all of us. The little mezuzah. <clears throat> Once upon a time, not so very long ago, in a city not unlike Chicago, Illinois, a little boy named Yomo lived with his mother, his father, and his pet turtle, Pupik. They lived in a tall, tall skyscraper, in a cozy two-bedroom apartment with hanging plants, a patio, and a self-cleaning oven. Mr. and Mrs. Auerbach worked very hard to maintain their middle-class lifestyle. Nora Auerbach taught second and third grade and spent three nights a week helping at the local women's shelter. Simon Auerbach spent 60 to 70 hours a week at his law practice and he coached Little League on Sundays. Little Yomo loved his parents very much, especially since, for his ninth birthday, they brought him to a pet store and allowed him to choose any pet in the place, besides a dog or a cat, because they weren't allowed in the building, besides a guinea pig, because Mrs. Auerbach thought they looked too much like rats, and besides a bird, because they were too delicate. Anyway, little Yomo walked around and around the pet shop, gazing into the crates, peering into cages, accidentally stepping on guppies that were flopping around outside the tank. Yomo nearly had his heart set on a Komodo dragon, but for two minutes the lizard just sat there, and sat there, and sat there, until Yomo nearly fell asleep. But out of the corner of the boy's eye, he saw something moving very slowly across the floor. Not as slowly as the lizard, of course, but slowly and surely crawling along just like a turtle. In fact, it was a turtle, a beautiful turtle with a green shell and a head colored with red and orange streaks. Yoma watched the turtle with fascination. How deliberately it moved! How carefully it put one foot in front of the other. And then suddenly, the pet store owner swooped down and grabbed the turtle in his big, rough hand. Escaped again, have you? He said with a booming voice. How am I ever going to sell you if you never stay in one place? The pet store owner was about to walk away when little Yomo pulled at his pant leg. Excuse me, said little Yomo, but what's his name? Who, oh, the turtle, said the store owner. Beats me. He never stays put long enough to be named. Mommy, I want him, said little Yomo. Are you sure, said Mrs. Auerbach. You'll have to feed him and change his tank and maintain a stable ecosystem. Whatever, said little Yomo. I want the turtle, and I'm going to name him Puppik. Wrap him up, said Mr. Auerbach. We're taking him home. And so, Mr. and Mrs. Auerbach and little Yomo returned to their rent-stabilized apartment with a new member of the family, Puppik the turtle. They also returned with a tank, gravel, fake branches, and $80 worth of food and medicine. And little Yomo was as good as his word. He fed Pupik every day and gave him fresh lettuce and chopped vegetables twice a week. He kept the tank warm and well lit and was always the best owner a reptile could have. 
and Popek, defying his reputation, didn't go anywhere. He crawled on the branches, he sipped from the water dish, but not once in two months did he go a foot from the tank. And then, one day, Mr. Auerbach came home breathless and very excited. What is it, dear? said Mrs. Auerbach. Yes, Daddy, cried Yomo. Why are you so sweaty and unkempt? Unbelievable news, said Mr. Auerbach, sitting in a kitchen chair. My new client is the chief rabbi of Canada. The chief rabbi of Canada, said Mrs. Auerbach. Who knew? Mr. Auerbach opened his leather briefcase. Rabbi Howard Saunders is suing the state of Illinois. Something to do with wrongful arrest and hate speech. It's very complicated, but he chose my firm to handle the suit. That's marvelous, honey, his wife said. Now put your things away. It's time for dinner. With this, Mr. Auerbach jumped from his chair. I almost forgot, he gasped. The Rebbe is on his way in five minutes. What? shouted Mrs. Auerbach and Yomo. He's stopping by after services just to meet me and get the basics out of the way. So we all have to be on our best behavior. Oh. Mr. Auerbach put his hand to the top of his head to make sure his kippah was in place. I'll clean up and get my papers in order. Yomo, please set the table and help your mother with dinner. And over the next three minutes, that's exactly what they did. Mr. Auerbach shaved, washed his face, and started putting paper after paper in different folders. Meanwhile, Mrs. Auerbach divided up the roast and vegetables, remembering to leave an extra serving for the unexpected visitor. Little Yomo set four places at the table, making sure to give the rabbi the nicest dish and the cleanest fork. When four minutes had passed, Mr. Auerbach began pacing nervously. Oh, I hope everything goes all right, he said. My career is riding on this. You'll be fine, said Nora, kissing his cheek. The food is ready, the house is clean, and we are all prepared. Mr. Auerbach looked fondly at his wife and at little Yomo. You're right, he said. Everything will be perfect. With that, he opened the door in expectation of the Rebbe's arrival. A minute passed, then another minute, then another. Each minute that passed, the tension grew. Where was the Rebbe, and when would he arrive? Another minute passed, and yet another, and yet another minute. The air was thick with quiet excitement, and then the intercom buzzer went off, startling the whole family. Nora gasped, Yomo jumped, and Mr. Auerbach bounced against the doorpost and frantically buzzed the intercom back. Come in, Rabbi Saunders, come in, he yelped. Mr. Auerbach realized that if he was too anxious, he would look foolish in front of this important man. So he mopped his brow, took a deep breath, he exhaled and even laughed a little at his own nervousness. Wish me luck, he smiled at little Yomo. Yomo smiled back, but then he looked down by his father's feet where he noticed an object on the floor. What's that? asked Yomo. What's what? said Mr. Auerbach. By your foot. Mr. Auerbach looked down. Then he looked up at the doorpost. Then he looked down again. Then he looked at the doorpost again. Oy, 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 said Mr. Auerbach. It's the mezuzah. It's falling off. In his excitement at the buzzing of the Rebbe, Mr. Auerbach had accidentally bounced against the doorpost and pulled off the box with a sacred scroll. Mr. Auerbach reached down and picked up the mezuzah, which had broken, crack, in two pieces. This is a catastrophe, cried Mr. Auerbach. The chief Canadian rabbi is coming to my home any second, and there's no mezuzah on the front door. Mrs. Auerbach ran to her husband and carefully took the broken pieces from his hand. You go meet the Rebbe at the elevator, she told him, and I'll try to find another mezuzah. Mr. Auerbach groaned and hurried out the door and into the hallway. 
Mrs. Auerbach closed the door and went rummaging through the kitchen drawers to find another kosher mezuzah. Little Yomo didn't know what to do. He stood frozen in place, hoping for the best, but anticipating disaster for his poor father. Yomo, his mother called, do me a favor, go find the hammer, I think it's in the bathroom closet. As if wakened from a trance, Yomo said, yes, mommy, and walked across the room. He was about to go to the closet when he passed by Puppet's tank. That's funny, thought little Yomo. I don't see him. Yomo peered into the top of the tank, looking for his turtle. But Puppet wasn't there. He must be under the rocks, thought Yomo, as he turned over two stones heated by the tank's lid. But under the stones, no Puppet. Nor was Puppet under the lettuce, nor was Puppet behind the water dish. Little Yomo looked behind the tank to see if Puppet had fallen there. But then his mother called, Yomo, the hammer, please. And Yomo ran off to the bathroom and began searching through the closet for the hammer and a good nail. Meanwhile, Mrs. Auerbach was sorting through the drawers, literally praying to find a good kosher mezuzah. Success! She found an old bronze mezuzah from their previous apartment in Jersey City. Nora quickly checked to see that the parchment was intact. I've got the hammer, shouted Yomo. I just need to find the nail. Hurry, pleaded Mrs. Auerbach. I can hear them at the elevator. With shaking hands, little Yomo opened the box of nails and tried to find a strong one without hurting his fingers. Gog it, he cried as he closed the box, slammed the door, and ran to his mommy. But just as she was taking the hammer and the nail from Yomo, the front door opened, and there stood Mr. Auerbach and the Grand Rebbe of Canada. Little Yomo could feel his heart sink in his chest. Mrs. Auerbach put on a brave smile and quickly hid the hammer and nail and mezuzah behind the toaster. Doing his best to hide his terrible dismay, Mr. Auerbach bowed to the Rebbe. Nora, Yomo, he said, this is Rav Saunders, our very distinguished guest. Shalom and welcome to our home, Mrs. Auerbach said, striding to the doorway. It's our pleasure. Rabbi Saunders smiled at Mrs. Auerbach and waved at little Yomo. Then, as he had done millions of times in his life when entering a house, he took the palm of his hand and kissed his fingertips. He then brought up his hand to the post of the doorway to kiss the mezuzah. But when he did so this time, the rabbi gasped and took a step back. Oh my God, he said. I can explain, said Mr. Auerbach. It was an accident, said Mrs. Auerbach. Don't be mad, pleaded little Yomo. Mad, said Rev Saunders. Why mad? This is the most beautiful mezuzah I have ever seen. Huh? said Mr. Auerbach, his eyes widening. Look at it, exclaimed the Rebbe. The shape, the color, the presence of it. I've seen tortoise shell mezuzahs before, but never of this magnificent quality. Yomo ran to the doorpost. There, on the side, not moving an inch, and right where the broken mezuzah used to be was Puppet, his beloved turtle. Reb Saunders touched his fingers gently to Puppet and strode into the room. He turned to Mr. Auerbach and he said, I have to say, when my advisors first suggested your law firm, I had my doubts. But you are obviously a man of such taste and fine Jewish values. How could I go wrong? All Mr. Auerbach could do was laugh and shake the rabbi's hand. Mrs. Auerbach called, dinner is served, and got little Yomo to help her bring out the food. And everyone had a terrific time at dinner. The meal was delicious, the mood was festive, and the conversation delightful. In fact, Mr. and Mrs. Auerbach were so engrossed in conversation with the Rebbe, that they never even noticed the three or four times little Yomo left the table. 
They never saw him take a piece of lettuce from his plate, get up quietly from his chair, and casually walk over to the doorpost. And they certainly didn't see when he sat back down again without any lettuce at all. The end. Well, children, wasn't that a marvelous story for pet owners and lawyers alike? And do you see the lovely messages we get from the little mezuzah? Sometimes the most troublesome and difficult people are the ones we can most count on if we treat them well and give them enough lettuce. Also, it isn't always what's on the doorpost that counts. It's the love and support that occurs between the four walls that is so much more important. And finally, my dear friends, this story tells us very clearly and very beautifully, check your goddamn mezuzahs. Don't let them be getting into such shape where they fall apart when you brush against the doorway. Common sense, people, use it. All right, Tyra Kindelach, that's our story for this evening. Now, brush your teeth, wash your hands, pray a little to Hashem, and go schlafen. Mommy and Daddy need their without you time. So, not bad for a second episode, eh? Did I avoid schlamazel seconds? Well, stop you, I thought I did. Can't please anybody nowadays. But I hope you learned something from this program about how an exiled Jew, like Columbus, turned things around and became a legend. Life gave him lemons, and he made borscht. And then there's Puppet the Turtle. Even that tiny little reptile could make a big difference to everyone around him. So, think of what each of us, even the most dull-witted, most insignificant losers, for example, my viewership, can contribute to make this a better world. I'd like to thank our sponsors for making this program possible. My gratitude also to Dave Lefkowitz, host of the radio program Dave's Gone By on WGBB out in Babylon. I've been a frequent guest on his Sunday night program, and not once has he made me vacuum, which I think is very sweet. And speaking of sweet, Dave's beautiful Jewish wife, Joyce, has helped this program every step of the way. And sometimes she wonders what she stepped in. On behalf of myself, my dear wife Miriam Libby, and our 19 children, Nehemia, Josiah, Shloimi, Chana, Rivki, Yehuda, Moish, Yechezkiel, Boruch, Avigdor, Yisroel, Hepzibah, Shaul, Aliza, Shimon, Gedalia, Naftuli, and Fred, by my first marriage, and our little baby Beryl, whose head, thank God, is starting to round out. This is Rabbi Saul Solomon wishing you a Columbus Day Sameach from every one of me to every one of you.